is less on uh, pure science and more on uh, observations I've had over over the years I've been here. I'm not talking to Mike, okay. Um, start off with a word of caution. I acknowledge I break all rule, known rules for slideshows, including making my font too small, shoving, my, uh, shoving way too much of my slide, having slides that wonder if I'm really at the right gathering, and using fun but useless animations. Sadly, my voice for rebellion lies within some software. <laughs> so, what I was asked to do, George and Dave Bass for people, <laughs> they're very friendly, but I, I said, can you give us a talk? I said, on what? A regional perspective on biodiversity, high level trends we're seeing, how it works together. Don't forget stressors and how we like to protect them, the biodiversity, not the stressors. Don't forget climate change and cultural history too, that's important. And I just kind of, I was like, ha, ah, ha, ah, ha, ah. that's funny. So anyways, with, uh, with this in mind, I wondered where to begin. So I kind of had these thoughts of biodiversity, how it works together. And then I kind of started thinking, why did they ask me anyways? And I kind of thought about it and kind of hung around uh, the Great Lakes area for a long time. So maybe they asked me for that reason. So anyways, I, uh, I thought what has changed and uh, my years here, and this, this is this is where this handsome young fella is me, like in 1990 uh, something, early 90s, and that was when we worked at the Massasauga. I worked at the Massasauga, so um, that was in the glory days of parks, and there's no real safety and all that stuff. But back in the early 1990s, I worked at the, before I worked at national parks. I worked at another well-known park, and it's important to know the change since then. That brown has finally faded from popularity. <laughs> that the staff no longer work and live out of Calhoun Lodge. And that my hair was on my head and my glasses were not. <laughs> anyway, so to get it back on track, biodiversity is often thought of as all the living things. But although that's true, the, the boundaries on what biodiversity is not just living and my person. So being the lazy person I am, by the time you had structure and function, organic and inorganic, uh, living and non-living, I get tired and I cannot separate them. So when I talk about biodiversity, I talk about everything. So I sat down and thought about this topic for days. And I found I accepted four things that underpin the, my, my observations of biodiversity. One, it's not natural or cultural. Be a lumper, not a splitter. It's one view, so I natural or catural. Whatever, I coined the term. Ecological unit is an archipelago. It's a very challenging ecosystem, but everything is adapted to be part of that unit. Biodiversity is always changing, and it's the essence of survival. Like it or not, we have an impact on this change. Even the do-nothing is a decision. Managing that change is critical for our survival. And call it philosophy, call it resilience, or just call it fact. But one way or another, there will be some sort of biodiversity when all is said and done. We just want to make sure we're part of it. But before we get too far, we want to know what we know. The Georgian Bay is a spectacular place. It is the reason we're all here, we are all here, and it is the best of what this country has to offer. In fact, it's probably the best of what this world has to offer. This place is amazing, and this biodiversity is amazing. I never want to lose sight of that. These are a lot of pictures. From so I'm sure you'll recognize a lot of these places, and it's uh, both culturally and uh, ecologically significant. But let's start with an ecosystem. So what I'm showing you here shouldn't be overly new. It's, uh, we, uh, we start up here with the drivers of change. There's my laser pointer. And that's things like climate and latitude and soil. So they're, they're kind of global in scope. They kind of set the tone for who we are. and then. Uh, landscape that, that helps define the, how the landscape works. And that the disturbance is the factor that, that influences the, the landscapes. Then there's um, habitats that follow that uh, 
that landscape and their species. Now what we do mostly is in this area here. This is uh, because species, you can, have a, you can have a direct impact on species if we introduce them or not introduce them or species at risk kind of things. And that's all the critters down here. And then the habitat, we can do a bit on habitat. But some of the stuff up here is just kind of mind boggling. How do you change that? How do you, so you can try, but to have an impact on the climate is kind of a global effort. And uh, it's, not, uh, it's not that easy to make a difference. So this is where we, we spend all of our time and, and uh, it's hard to tell whether you're making a difference up at this high level. Anyways, this is kind of a sense to how the system kind of works. And then um, and my, my animations are going already. So you see that 10,000 years ago, there was lots of change in this area. Lake levels went up, lake levels went down, lake levels, kind of like the rings on a bathtub. They kind of stain for a while and then they go down, they stain again. So anyways, this is what happens. And the trees, they, they kind of, when the water goes up the trees, there's less space. And then the water goes down, there's more space for the trees. And then uh, I know this because um, I used to scuba dive quite a bit. And I remember scuba diving over the Bruce Peninsula and what we uncovered was a tree in situ, like under the water. It's like 10 meters under the water. So you can't be growing as a tree and uh, be when wet. So you had to be dry at one time. And then there's also the, uh, the terraces you see on the Great Lakes. So there's kind of these rolling edges. They were old beach ridges. So that's, that's kind of my observation that, that told me that this little this area like thousands of years ago, was kind of like this up and down water levels. And then uh, maybe 5,000 years ago, I used, they, you kind of, uh, the, the indigenous peoples, they kind of were using this area as a, and I, I kind of as a summer residence. I know this because uh, at the Bruce or at uh, GBI, we've uncovered thousands upon thousands of artifacts kind of showing their footprint and where they, they lived and fished and and all this stuff. So we know that they were here and we know that they also had an influence on the landscape. In fact, they were kind of, um, they kind of used the landscape for their, for their livelihood. And we know this because, um, like I know this, because I've read records and the, the fact that they burned the hilltops and they used this in order to create blueberries. And uh, this is also moose habitat. And so the, the use of fire was, was uh, it's kind of, it's kind of like ecological forensics. You kind of look at the forest and you see what happened because the, the forest can tell you the story of the past. And if, um, if I see that there's lots of red oak in the super canopy, I know that red oak likes to, sur likes to start on its life cycle in very open areas with lots of sunlight. So if this area, you know, it was open at one time. There had to have been some sort of disturbance to let it be open. So what's happening is this red oak is growing up real tall, like for 200 years, because I know the age of the tree. And then what's happening now is that there's sugar maple coming up behind it. So this means that there's shade in this area. So if there was sunlight to start and shade follows it, that means there's less disturbance. So there is, there's some reason to believe that this tree, and I, I kind of go and I talk to the trees and ask them how they're doing. And uh, there's this kind of story that you can kind of look when you kind of piece together this, this, and this goes back well, like a long time ago. So these forests started all, quite a while ago. Anyways, that's, um, and then what happened is there's, the Europeans came in and we kind of uh, cut all the trees down. And, uh, and that was resource extraction. And until about 1900, then um, the, People get GBA and they started saying there should be more of this land not cut down and we want it for a cottage or, or um, the park, for, for example, was, was established. So that's how I know that because that's where I work. And uh, so that's sort of um, how the system began. And then uh, this is my, my pause in case I need to catch my breath. This is the Holly Watermark, anyways. Whew. Anyways, I have no notes on that. That's a, that's a high water mark from a few years ago. So the food market had picked on, it was right under water. And this, is, this was an island and then it got covered up. That was kind of a fun day to be up there. Anyway, so this is now, this is where we're gonna zone in on what the archipelago is. So, um, 
There's my cross section of an island. And there's these little islands. And there's these small little islands. So this might be um, something like the Bosley Island or Moon Island or Perry Island. Uh, something, something acts like an island. So those are the really big ones. And then uh, there's the other islands, like the Pine Island Group, the Umbrellas, the McCoys. They're the way off the bits offshore. So it's, um, it's important to know that from west to east, this is my wind blowing. This is my, this is my animations. They're just kind of fun. So the wind blows from west to east, primarily. And that this is, well, what happens is this, this, uh, this wind coming from there, and there's all these, a lot of these small little islands. Um, because, because the wind's blowing in from the west to east, not so much the summertime, it's the wintertime when the ice falls. The ice kind of scours. So these act as shields, and that, that, that takes the trees off. And what happens is the only things that can really live out there are small little things or like colonial nesting birds. So that's kind of a, a, a lower biodiversity out there. And then uh, as you move in, because these act as a shield, these inner islands, uh, they have deeper soils and they're protected by, the, by these outer banks. And, um, but they're also exposed to more development pressures, including the species at risk. So, um, so the drivers of change in this case are like climate, and just remember the slide from before, uh, the, the top-down dynamics were climate and soil, and there's, there's what's followed what I call a gap phase disturbance. So this, the trees grow up in the shallows, the soil's really shallow, tree falls over, creates a bit of sunlight, next tree goes up. So there's, there's these gaps that, uh, and so there's much higher biodiversity. And these are white pine, red oak ecosystems. And then there's these out, um, other ones which are dominated by climate because that's the ice. So the ice scouring is different than the, the gap disturbance, the landscape dynamics, and then the, what happens is there's lichens out there and there's a low diversity. So the higher, the higher the amount of exposure, this is where you're seeing a lot of crap on one slide. This is what I do, I put too much on one, because I got a lot of So anyways, the exposure goes, uh, as the exposure goes down, the diversity gets higher. So let me tell you, this is a tale of two snakes. So, um, there goes my thing again. So anyways, so there's one that's located here on the Big Islands, and that is the Massasauga. Massasauga needs three things, just like everyone else does. Needs a place to sleep in the winter, needs a place to suntan in the summer, and needs a place to, to lay its eggs and, not, and eat and that kind of thing. Anyways, so that, that trifecta is found in, uh, in an area. It needs to be, it can be a small area. The Massasauga will uh, kind of survive on that. So the Massasauga doesn't move more than a kilometer in a year. So it's quite fascinating to gather all those three things. And um, finally, and if it's got them all, then it'll, it'll survive and fit and come back to the same spot for overwinter and, and keep surviving. Whereas this snake, we'll call it the Eastern Fox Snake, takes a huge area. And it goes up to like 16 kilometers in the summer. So though they communally hibernate, it goes, it uses the whole archipelago. So it's like the, it's like the bison of our area. So it, it kind of goes out and it, it doesn't matter how cold the water is, it just goes right across. It goes out to these other islands because it's, it survives on like, like uh, it goes after bird's eggs. So one place there's bird's eggs or there's colonial nesting birds are out there. So that's kind of fun that it survives on this whole huge area where the other ones survive in this very tiny area. So that's, um, that's sort of how the, uh, in a nutshell, it's kind of confusing. But there's a lot of biodiversity that happens in this area. So it's, um, how does, where does this leave biodiversity? It's enormously complex because um, the driver is a big unknown. The climate change is happening and we don't know, we don't know how it's happening, we don't know how much it will happen, how fast and, and uh, what that will mean. But as the water warms up, we have to start asking ourselves, if the ice does not scour these other islands, will the vegetation begin to establish itself? Will it alter the biodiversity of those islands and how that change concerns us? How this, this gap phase then form, if these gaps start to close in, will there be more fire and stuff like that? So these are the kind of uh, things that keep me up at night. Um, but wait, there's more. Um, 
there's not only the east-west, and I won't get into this a long time, um, be, because there's north-south thing as well. The south end of uh, the bay is very much uh, a different ecosystem than the north end. I talk about the north. Bose Island is kind of the dividing line, and in the north of that is the the, uh, the Canadian Shield, and south of that is the uh, Great Lake St. Lawrence, um, just based on soil depth. But I, uh, I kind of know that, but I'm not going to get into that right now. So uh, there's an evolving understanding. And uh, there's, uh, there's these factors that influence biodiversity. You know, when I was 20, I figured it all out. And I was really proud of myself. And I just saw that biodiversity had a problem, and there's nice and neat, there's a solution. And that was great. But then I started to look a little, I grew up and I was like, yeah, it's not that easy. So I said, biodiversity might be going one track and then we make a, a change and it goes another way. So um, this is, it's not that easy. And then I got to the point where it's just like, this is my head. Everywhere. What the heck? <laughs> you can see I kind of scanned myself in there. Anyways, that's, uh, that's the way I look at things now. So I'm, um, it's not so simple. So anyways, we've only been studying things like, like this, using the scientific method uh, for just a few decades now. So how are we going to know anything? And the ecosystem changes over hundreds of years. Um, now there's another reason we can understand that change, and that's, um, that's, that's this uh, two-eyed seeing approach. There's other sources of information we're not looking at, uh, or not that we're just starting to. Number of variables is pretty much infinite. Even the most studied thing, like ourselves, we say, we barely understand how a human works. And uh, there isn't a natural anymore. So the idea of there being something that we can compare to, like no benchmarks. So there's, um, I recall an ecologist who once said, not only is nature more complex than we think, it's more complex than we can think. <laughs> and I hope you didn't think I'd have all the answers. So I'm not going to. So despite its complexity, I feel we're on the right track and what we do next. Uh, to summarize my presentation, Eric Fellow's complex, complicated, and biodiversity is complicated. So that's kind of, I could have said that at the beginning, but <laughs> then I wouldn't have presented so long. Anyways, um, how do we see biodiversity in the future? And this is, um, we're doing good things, but we ought to look back. So the climate was like a little sun down here, and it's gotten to be a bigger sun. That's my graphic for how the economy gets bigger. So the forest started like 200 years ago, and then when we get to the current state of the forest, we have to, we have to decide where it's gonna go in many ways. Do we wanna, like if we just let it go, what's gonna happen most likely, on my prediction, and uh, I'm not, not hanging my hook on this, if we just let it go naturally, um, the climate will get warmer, and these species, will become more stressed as it, as it gets warmer. And they'll be more subject to invasive species and things like that. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna get a, probably a catastrophic die off of these species. So we, in many ways, we had to decide that, do we want that to happen or do we want to kind of uh, start to when we look at restoration, do we look at species that might be able to survive better into the future? So that's the kind of thing that I'm thinking of in terms of, um, in terms of, in terms of fitness of species. Um, do we look at the same area and keep it the same way? Or do we look at um, how, let's say the Massasauga requires these three things. Uh, we've often talked about corridors or networks. Is that what we need? Or is this going to be the species survives well here and then in the future is going to survive well here? So I kind of call it a temporal corridor. It's kind of like it pops up everywhere, but that's just me. Um, so anyway, so you have to look at you have to look at the past to look at the future. I think that's kind of important to know which way the because if you you just planted what you have now that was growing back then, the 200 years ago, the conditions in 50 years aren't going to be the same as they were 200 years ago. So how do you, how do you think it's going to survive? I don't know. I don't know. So, anyways, still those are my graphics coming up now. <laughs> they weren't just floating trees; they were on islands. Yeah. Anyways, um, our conservation tools. Um, education is a wonderful tool, but changing attitudes and uh, and takes time. 
but and not everyone will be convinced, especially of snakes. I was on the Massa recovery team for like ever, and uh, we always tried to make people like the Mass Saga. It's just not going to happen in many ways. So you you just get them to stop killing it. That's a that's a victory. So I just uh, I look at it differently now than I used to. I just kind of call them and can you just not stick a shovel in it? So I don't want to kill people. The snakes are dangerous. But anyways, we're going to have to use education. Um, but just uh, use it and don't. Uh, science, uh, get out there and observe and ask questions. So when I'm talking about getting out there, why is this happening? What is the story behind this ecosystem, whatever like that? So ask lots of questions and keep the questions going because someone, someone can answer them, not, not me. Um, set long-term goals. Uh, so that, that's kind of an objective that coming from the government, we don't do that very often. We often set a goal based on the election cycle. So if we could set a goal that goes longer, that would be helpful because ecosystems evolve over many, many years. And uh, we just kind of like give you money for species risk and, and they hope for the best. Anyways, models, um, ecological models, they're cool, but they're all wrong. So, but it's just how wrong you can accept it. And that's okay to be wrong. And uh, don't expect the right answers. Remember, they, the ecosystems are complicated. So we can't think of all the factors that are affected. And the threats, if we don't put a plug in it, you may have a much bigger problem. So that's, uh, that was back in my day when I fixed all of those problems <laughs> and the boat sunk one day. And so we, we kind of salvaged that. Anyways, that's about my presentation right now. Uh, we do have time for questions for Andrew. It might be how his brain works. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or it doesn't. Don't ask that. Yeah. Becky. One of the most exciting projects you've been part of. Oh. Exciting project. It was pretty exciting. Restoration. Did the compound? There was um, the 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 operation on Bosley Island used to be quite significant. Like uh, we need the signs from every national park in Canada. We these, there was a carving shop, a boat. There was like fifteen kind of operational buildings. We removed all that. It's not an exciting like like you're trapping a bear. That's like woohoo. Area now, see the before and after pictures. You're like, we made a difference, and that's that's the business I got into this for, is to make a difference. So that I can see after 20 years, um, and having a huge amount of team effort to do this, we uh, we made a difference in that way. So that's that's the one thing I was excited about. Thank you. Do you think you can er eradicate the phragmites on Bersley Island? Absolutely not. So I know you're tracking. The phragmites are thick in our area. So heavy. And we, we, we just ended a five-year project. And we barely took a nick. Because we stopped the, its conduit for getting to us. What we're going to do is was we're going to tackle it in certain regions. I'm just saying they're that now. They're, they're listening and learning regions so that getting and expanding both in areas that'll be everything. But to take on that area, Bosley Point, it'll take a. We did a lot of work on that team that did that. It just seems to be one step back. Unless something like a flood happens and the thing just doesn't survive. Right. So it's, I know the GBF and, and, and the teams, the external partners are always on me to do that. I just am exhausted. We put a lot of, it takes two things. You have, to, you have to cut it and then you have to do all kinds of things to it to get rid of it. chemicals. No, we were It's it's an option someday, but I think because of the the species of risk we have in 
Eric, I think we're just not there yet. Oh, it might, it might be, but I have to retire, but. <laughs> sure. Andrew, thank